Hello, my name is Susan Hawthorne and uh, I'm from Australia. And oh, in Susan, Australia. Susan, 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 okay. we need to start a, in one minute because the ah. attendees won't be on. So <laughs> we're good. this hello attendees who've already started coming in. We're gonna, we will wait for about one minute before you start. Okay, no problem. Joe, is it time to start? Yeah, it's good to start now. Everybody's, mo most women have arrived. Okay. Hello, my name is Susan Hawthorne and I'm from Australia. Uh, in Australia, when we do speeches, we uh, do an acknowledgement of land uh, of the original inhabitants of Australia. And I'm speaking to you today from Jiru land in uh, far north Queensland. So, I'm, I'm, we're here today, Farida Akhtar and I, um, because we're going to be talking about the work of Vandana Shiva. Um, I, I just want to say a few words about Farida, who I met oh, many years ago in the 19, late 1980s, I think it was. And Farida is a powerhouse and she uh, runs an organization called Ubanig in Bangladesh, which is an NGO that has set up one of the biggest uh, seed uh, community seed banks in the world. She's also a publisher, uh, runs a company called Nariganta Prabhatana and a feminist bookshop, which I have visited and an organic uh, shop and a, a restaurant as well. And she has written a whole stack of books, some of which I will refer to during my talk. So first of all, I want to talk about Vandana and um, her as a radical feminist. Now, um, as some ha have, have pointed out on, online that Vandana is not a radical feminist, and that is probably true. Um, however, uh, Vandana has a lot of things that are very important uh, for radical feminist analysis. And um, I certainly have learned a great deal from her work and I have, um, been able to extend my own radical feminist thinking uh, because of her work. So I just wanted to mention that. And another thing is that I've heard people say that um, Vandana hasn't said anything against trans. Now, the only conversation that I have had with Vandana on that issue um, was during a Philia event that uh, Farida and Vandana and I were part of and I raised the issue of, of trans and she responded in a way that suggested to me she understood the issue however it she hasn't spoken about it so I'm just sort of saying that at the beginning as a way of just making it clear what I know uh, and and I think that's fairly um I think that makes, makes the issue clear. So I just want to talk a bit about Vandana. Um, I first heard her speak at the fourth International Feminist Book Fair in Barcelona in 1990. She was talking about her first book, uh, Staying Alive, um, which is, this is the latest version of it. The original edition was published by um, Women Unlimited and had a different cover. Women and uh, sorry, um, Kali for women um, in in India, uh, and then in 1993 um, at Spinifex, um, publisher at Spinifex Press, uh, we published a book that she co-wrote with Maria Mees called Ecofeminism, uh, and I got to know more of her work um, after attending the People's Perspectives on Population conference in Bangladesh, which was organized by Farida. Uh, and 
and that uh, through the although Vandana wasn't there um, we talked about her work and 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 I had read some of her work not a lot but I had read some um, and so it, that particular conference in 1993 in Bangladesh was the catalyst for my PhD uh, while politics feminism globalization and biodiversity, which are finally published in 2002. And I used Vandana's work in my opening chapter as, as an, um, a theoretical um, work that enabled me to then move through and explain some of the things that she had said in her writing up to that point. Um, and not everything had been, you know, she's got more books out since then. Um, she so I spent the next decade re researching various aspects of biodiversity, and that was when I read her book Monocultures of the Mind, uh, and it really blew me away because it really struck me as an important book and was published um, uh, in 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 Malaysia actually, um, Third World Network published the book. I don't know if it's still in print or not. Um, Vandana has won lots of international awards, the Right Livelihood Award. She also won the Sydney Peace Prize, which brought her to Australia, um, which was very good for us at Spinifex. Um, and uh, she's spoken at international conferences like the 1992 UN conference, um, which was where the Convention on um, biological diversity was ratified. She, she includes the, the convention in monocultures of the mind, but she also criticizes it. Um, and then subsequently at Spinifex Press, we co-published with Women Unlimited, uh, Soil Not Oil in 2008, Making Peace with the Earth in 2012, Seed Sovereignty, Food Security, which is about women at the vanguard of seed saving. That was 2015. And most recently, Oneness versus the 1% in 2018. And next year, we hope to publish her autobiography. Uh, so that just gives you a bit of background about who Vandana is. But Farida has known Vandana for longer than I have. So Farida, um, I think you should <laughs> speak now. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, and I really thank Women's Human Rights Campaign today that you have organized this and we have an opportunity to talk about Vandana's work because I consider that it's very important as feminist uh, to all of us. And thank you, Susan, that you have chosen this book particularly to talk about today. So. I would like to also go back a little bit, you know, to talk about before I talk about this. Uh, Staying Alive was um, was really a groundbreaking book as a you know feminist issue as well because it it introduced us to the Chipko movement, like how the women in the forest uh, tried to save the trees by clinging together. So Chipko means actually you hug the trees. So that was uh, how we uh, knew about these movements and um, that was uh, very important for the feminist movement as well because many um, time we forget that environmental movement is, is very much a feminist movement, it's a women's movement. It's not only about some environmentalists who often tend to be men. And also I was interested in staying alive and just to mention that staying alive, you know, the book was given to us um, uh, by Kamla Vasin, who recently passed away, a South Asian feminist leader. So she was very active. So she gave that book to me. And so one critique was very important about the UN decade of women you know, which was 1975 to 85, and then uh, talked about that how um, it was a, based on a false assumption that improvement of women's economic position would automatically flow from an expansion and diffusion of the development process. But at the end of the decade, it was clear that women's economic position, income and employment worsened, and their health, nutritional, educational, 
status has declined. That was in staying alive. So that was very important. So let me just uh, tell you how I got connected to Vandana's work and how we knew each other. Um, you know, I was not in agriculture, not in environment. I was actually uh, researching on population control issues. And um, you know, together with Renata, Dr. Renata Klein, Maria Mies, Jalna Hanmar, and many other women scientists, we formed Feminist International Network for Resistance Against Reproductive and Genetic Engineering. And we uh, looked at the population control policy as an imposition on um, uh, women's bodies with harmful contraceptives in the name of the Western feminists are talking about reproductive rights. And that is imposed on the poor women in Bangladesh as a contraceptive dumping and experiment in, in, on her body. So uh, Susan, actually, Vandana did not come to the 1993 conference, but we had uh, the Findrage, first Findrage conference in 1989 and in Kumilla. And this declaration we remember that we had. And we, Vandana was here and she presented a paper and I think I must mention the contribution of Maria Mies here, who brought Vandana into uh, this conference. And uh, then she presented a paper, not only on reproductive technologies, but on uh, genetic engineering in agriculture. Actually, the things that she is talking about in the monocultures of mind, and uh, the same things that she uh, mentioned. And uh, Vandana with her, uh, sister, uh, Mira Shiva, they both presented. And here it is important that uh, it, it showed that how capital is searching for new areas of investment in women's wombs and seeds. So this is important. We were talking about women's wombs, but actually uh, the seeds and that the life must be commodified and industrialized by capital for profit. The surplus population created by eliminating rural folks from land and livelihood are terms as surplus. So this was very important um, concept for us because we were actually sufferers of this. And then I would um, uh, also like to mention that um, Bandana uh, talked about green revolution and uh, destruction of ecological stability. And the conference was actually being held in an institution, Bangladesh Academy for Rural Development, which was where the green revolution experiments were being done. So, mm -hmm. so that was very important. And then Vandana mentioned about pesticide, herbicide resistant varieties and named the companies like Monsanto, DuPont, you know, all these companies who were, um, uh, uh, you know, and before um, um, uh, Susan, you go on other thing, I also wanted to mention that as monocultures of the mind, you know, that was in 1993, but, um, you know, the work uh, as an activist on, uh, on uh, environmental issue, together with Maria Mies, you know, we had a, meeting in Rome uh, on World Food Conference, where women from Italy and Europe who could bring food, you know, we all were there and actually um, denounced genetically modified food and all this uh, rubbish uh, food that are being promoted by companies. So that was very, very important. So our relationship grew over this, um, uh, technology, biotechnology, pesticide use, green revolution, challenging green revolution. So that's, uh, I will stop now and so you can uh, add more, but this was um, as a chronology of my relationship with uh, Vandana, together with Maria Mies is very, very important. Yes, because her work with Maria um, was important in terms of getting that connection that, that you had through FinRage and the, 
the, the population control and the seeds and the pesticides and the Monsantos and all of that and, and the genetic engineering. And I have not been a member of FinRage, but I have learned quite a lot from Renata and from you and from my reading um, about FinRage and participating in, in various events. Um, but I'm not as knowledgeable as you are. Um, but the other thing I think um, that's important about Vandana's work is that it is a structural analysis. Mm. Radical feminists love structural analyses. Um, and that's why I think it's important. Uh, that's one reason why it's important for radical feminists. Vandana has a very sharp critique of systems. Um, and perhaps this comes from her background as a physicist and with an extra understanding because she is Indian um, of how a culture like that of India could be colonized and demeaned under the rulership of the British Empire in its various incarnations, just to name a few, the East India Company, the Victorian era colony, eventually a line drawn on a map that separated people from Pakistan and um, and India. And of course, Bangladesh used to be part of Pakistan, but then in 1975, 71. Became, oh, my apologies, became an independent country. So, um, so this is a, a quote from um, Monocultures of the Mind, which is this book here. Uh, and it goes, the universal local dichotomy is misplaced when applied to the Western and indigenous traditions of knowledge, because the Western is a local tradition which has spread worldwide through colonization. And I think that's a very important um, quote. And I became excited when I read that because I saw in it a, a reflection of my own experience as a colonized Australian uh, where the seasons are reversed, and, and I'm not colonised in the same sorts of ways that as Indigenous Australians are colonised, but nevertheless our minds were, um, where the seasons were, were reversed, and it appeared that we lived in some kind of topsy-turvy world whenever we compared ourselves to the British. So in the world of colonised knowledge, nothing exists in quite the same way. And when I began to look at it through the lens of a feminist critique of patriarchy, it intensified. And adding to that a consideration of Indigenous knowledge in Australia was a further expansion of Vandana's analysis. So just briefly, colonial knowledge is spread by violence and misrepresentation in the following ways. It creates invisibility of knowledge, it disappears by denying its existence and denying it the status of systematic knowledge. Uh, so uh, knowledge of Indigenous, uh, Indigenous knowledge, for example, is just regarded as gobbledygook. You know, it's not seen as genuine knowledge. The adjective scientific has more to do with power and less to do with knowledge and it results in a fragmentation of knowledge. And under patriarchy, it results in the intentional disappearance of women's knowledge, even that women have a history. So some examples of these are violence and misrepresentation, the imposition of colonial language. In Australia, Aboriginal children were forbidden to speak their mother tongue, and through that they became disconnected from their cultural roots and in particular concepts that are found in say the Gurindji language or the Naranjari language, but not in English. Among immigrant Australians, that is everybody who came here after 1788, um, oops, losing my spot, um, um, who came either as convicts or settlers in inverted commas, they did not have the local language to call things by, and so approximate English words were used that don't quite match up. If you know what a desert oak looks like, 
uh, you will know that it looks nothing like the oak trees that you find in England or in across Europe. The desert oak is a very stringy um, tree that doesn't give very much shade at all. I, I don't even know why they called it that. So many Australians actually don't know the names of the plants that grow around them. And this is a method of erasure. And it's so important to know the world around you and to be able to name it. So the local knowledge is disappeared. Uh, I worked at Penguin in Australia for a while and it was very hard to get Australian books uh, to be picked up by, by head office in the UK. But the Australian arm of Penguin carried books like The Wildflowers of Southeast England, which is a perfectly worthy book, but not very useful in Australia. And this was the cultural edge of knowledge disappearance and was amplified in every other area of the arts or science. And denying the importance of knowledge was tantamount to denying its existence. In Australia, you hear the phrase, the cult, a cultural cringe very frequently, because that, that refers to putting um, European knowledge, English knowledge ahead of Australian. And um, so for, uh, certainly while I was a child, um, the cultural cringe was very, very large. Uh, but when you take it, look at it from a feminist perspective, it's readily seen in the ways in which women's knowledge is denied made invisible and belittled. And so I want to draw some parallels. Vandana writes that modern Western knowledge is a particular cultural system with a particular relationship to power. Patriarchy is an assumed knowledge system and it too has a particular relationship to power. So that an ordinary person, a woman or a man in the street would not know what women's knowledge might mean. Who among us hasn't discovered some amazing woman of the past who should be a household name? Just to mention a few, Jocelyn Bell Burnell, who detected the first radio pulsar. She should have got the Nobel Prize, but her bosses did. Vera Rubin, who discovered dark matter. Biophysicist Rosalind Franklin, whose X-ray crystallography made possible findings about DNA and RNA. Emily Nurther, a mathematician who worked in the area of abstract algebra. Or Maleva Marich Einstein, mathematician and the first wife of Albert, both of whom, that is she and Albert, worked on the theory of relativity. And you can find um, very good stuff by... Um, um, Centre Thermal Plutz, um, and you just look up Centre Thermal Plutz online and you will find uh, fabulous stuff. So to say something more about patriarchy and uh, the development of language, it was most likely women who developed language way, 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 way back. Uh, I, probably by talking to children or the gathering of foodstuffs or the preparation of food, as well as making various articles such as pottery and weaving cloth. But the popular patriarchal imagination suggests that it was man the hunter or inventor. Now, if you're going hunting, you don't want to yell out words while you're hunting. You actually have to stay silent. So to suggest that men invented language when they went hunting is really quite ludicrous because you would scare away the animal. And if you were hunting a dangerous animal, you might actually be eaten. So it's not something you want to do. Uh, the disappearance of women's knowledge is evident in the view that patriarchy is both universal and inevitable, which it is not. Uh, compared to women's culture, patriarchy is really quite young. It's a mere five to 6,000 years. The cultures that had a gynocentric view of the world go back many tens of thousands of years, in, indeed hundreds of thousands of years. The erasure and fragmentation of this knowledge is of a different understanding of the world is due to patriarchy, war, slavery, and an increasing disconnection from the environment. 
And and I think it's important. I mean, I don't. It's not part of this talk. But if you want to read more on that, then uh, the work of Maria Gimbutas is absolutely central to understanding uh, the origins of patriarchy. Um, so, Farida, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, that? for me, um, you know, monocultures of mind. You know, I I found that when uh, Vandana Shiva mentioned in her, in the introduction of the book that um, monoculture of mind is uh, that it makes diversity disappear from perception and consequently from the voice. So the diversity issue and also as you has referred that the notion of disappeared knowledge systems is the most important contribution that she had. Local knowledge is made to disappear by simply not seeing it as she says by negating its very existence while uh, the Western systems of knowledge have generally been used as universal. You know, as, uh, as a person from Bangladesh, I can feel that always, you know, whenever we are given any knowledge from outside, that is the uh, actual knowledge and ours is the local knowledge and it doesn't, it cannot be universal. So what we saw, um, uh, I think, um, Susan, if I can uh, talk a little bit about Naya Krishi at this time, yes. so how to link that with uh, Vandana's work and also when Vandana came to Bangladesh, she visited our, um, you know, uh, rural areas uh, where farmers are uh, saving the seeds. So it's a Naya Krishi Andalon <clears throat> is a biodiversity based farming practice and it's a movement of the small peasants. And um, so we started that in 1991, you know, after the flood of 1988, when the farmers who were actually using um, um, chemicals in the modern agricultural practices, they were affected by severe flood and then they couldn't do anything. World Bank actually withdrew the subsidies. So the fertilizer were expensive and they couldn't buy it anymore. So when the farmers approached us and we said that, okay, as environmental conscious persons, we cannot support the chemical uh, use in agriculture, but let's try to do something else. But it was interesting at this moment, we saw how the knowledge of women differed from the uh, even male farmers knowledge and the erosion of knowledge happened more at the male farmers level. And they, while the farmers, male farmers were looking for an alternative uh, to, uh, to the chemical fertilizer, and they were made to believe that, actually like Vandana mentions in the book, that the Tina syndrome, as if there is no alternatives. So the farmers also believe that um, if you cannot use chemical fertilizer or pesticide, you cannot grow food anymore. And that's how what they learned over uh, two, three decades of um, green revolution. So we, when we talked uh, to the farmers about it, um, we found that um, women were responding more easily. And also they said that actually it is not only shifting the chemicals, but also you have to change the seeds. And by taking away the seeds that women used to preserve and the knowledge that they had before are destroyed because they wanted to promote certain few varieties of seeds. Um, and Vandana has shown, you know, in the book, uh, you know, when I was reading it, I found so much similarity that it is, uh, when she is talking about India, but it, it is the same situation in Bangladesh. And that um, the seeds are taken away, um, you know, which is actually biopiracy, I would say, that it is taken away from the farmers to the national gene banks, and then from the national gene banks to the International Rice Research Institute. Bangladesh used to had 15,000 varieties of rice alone, but now we have only 7,000 plus varieties in the National Gene Bank and Nayakishi farmers have a collection of over 3,000 varieties because we are consciously preserving it. And the women, you know, 
we have to um, respect the knowledge of the woman and the uh, courage they had when we said that no we won't go for modern agriculture anymore what can we do they said we will preserve seeds and the slogan was sisters keep seeds in your own hands don't let it go outside and that is so powerful and i think that is a real feminist um, uh, movement because you are taking control of your life. You are not letting others uh, control over it. So I think this is um, very important. And Nayakishi farmers have been uh, working uh, with the, uh, um, uh, you know, with many small farmers. And now they are able to use diverse food. You know, Bandana has mentioned uh, very clearly that uh, the food crops that they used to grow in India in different uh, states of India, but the local food is uh, different in, in each state, but modern agriculture makes a uniform, you know, only you have to have rice or wheat or something, you know, you, you don't have a variety of it. So the diversity is lost. But um, Nayakishi talks about the diversity and we are uh, producing, um, our farmers are producing the diverse crops as they can uh, grow, um, uh, you know, in their uh, specific uh, regional environmental conditions. Are you there, um, uh, Susan? Or did we lose her? Anyway. I, I would still like to go on and to say that if you compare uh, modern agriculture and it has to, it is, um, which um, Bandana also mentioned is that modern chemical agriculture is violent and masculine. Industrial chemical based farming disarticulates women from her command over agrarian production, shifting her role to technologies. The knowledge erosion, uh, you know, happens among the farmers, um, and that is quite um, quite significant the way it goes on. Yes, Farida, I'm um, Joe. You remember the host, yes. and I've, I'm just coming on here, so you've got somebody to talk to. Yes, okay. <laughs> to take over from Susan. Susan will come back on. I guess her internet's broken. Okay. Um, just so you're not on your own. Um, so yeah. I've been listening and. Um, uh, so, yeah, so uh, continue and, and then okay. I'll... Okay, um, I think um, what uh, Susan, when she will come back, she might add this. And I, I want to add uh, uh, about Susan's work as well, because she mentioned that she went to Bangladesh and that made her, uh, you know, um, uh, write the wild uh, politics. And then later on, the last book that she has is The Vortex. I think you all have seen it, The Vortex. And in this book, she mentioned, talks about uncultivated food, which she actually saw in Bangladesh and was quite inspired. She actually dedicated a whole chapter on it. And this is, again, a very important thing that in the Monoculture of Mind uh, book, you know, Vandana, it talks about the issue of destruction of diversity as weeds. So, you know, in the forest, you know, you say that, so the weeds are no good. You know, you will have to have the certain plants which we needed, others are no good. And so the herbicides that the companies made are just destroying um, any grains, you know. So she says that the destruction of biological diversity is intrinsic to the very manner in which the reductionist forestry paradigm conceives of the forest. She was talking more in the context of forest. And then she also mentioned that some of the crops that are either marginalized because they are not the mainstream crops. So um, they were not allowed to grow. Only those crops were allowed to grow, which are uh, coming from the green revolution paradigm or which needs um, use of chemicals or the fertilizer and chemicals. So um, Susan's work is also very important for me here, um, which she wrote uh, in, in the book Vortex. And um, yeah, she says that uncultivated as a concept 
um, uh, with focus on agrobiodiversity. She talks about not only about the crops or plants, she talks about songs, the stories, you know, which we forgot almost that in, the, in feminism, you know, or in the women's movement, we come closer to each other when we can laugh, we can sing together, we can, uh, you know, any, do anything. And those are, you know, getting lost. Yeah. So, I mean, there's uh, the uh, in uh, sort of uh, radical feminist theory that's sort of whole like straight, straight radical feminist theory or, or um, there are so many parallels uh, and it, it's, I think it's seeing the world in almost the same way because there's, I suppose a thing that sums, sums it up for me is that I think think Mary Daly said this, but somebody mm -hmm. said what they do to trees, what men do to trees, they do to women. And yeah. that, um, that sort of links everything. If you see what is done to trees um, uh, all over the world is they see trees uh, mostly as a resource that once it's destroyed or cut down, um, you can uh, sell it and you can make it into something, you can objectify yeah. it. And, and also this whole reduction of trees to just their economic value and this sort of on purpose misunderstanding of, of the community of trees that's sort of coming out now. So yeah. a lot of those things. And then the other thing you were just saying that really links up, but it sparked lots of sort of ideas is this thing of undomesticated. That's a big thing in, um, that the patriarchy or men would like women to be domesticated under their control and has an ideology of us being um, uh, coming from them. You know, they're the first source and they're technologically creating everything. So uh, both of those two things are absolutely, they sort of link up together. They're so parallel or inter intertwined, yeah. Yeah, and I think um, um, by denying uh, excess of, you know, in a country like Bangladesh, our majority women are living in the rural areas and they are poorer and they also don't have access to land, they don't own land. So they actually have to have access to the common land where they can collect food um, uh, for themselves. So these are the uncultivated food that we talk about. And uh, as Susan, I was talking about vortex and the uncultivated food. You know, we started on that and Joe also added something. But before uh, Susan, you know, you talk about it, I, I want to tell everybody is that okay. in Bangladesh, yeah. in Bangladesh, when we did a research on, um, you know, on the uncultivated plants and food, and it was a South Asian study also, we found 100 different species of leafy greens that are edible and are growing on their own. And in Bangladesh, we found that 40% of the diet in the community are coming from these uncultivated sources. So these are so important, but these are undermined, these are marginalized and can be killed by herbicides of Monsanto. And they, they just can kill them because they don't need it. So this is really very, very uh, strongly, you know, anti-woman and uh, anti-feminist. So this is patriarchal destruction. So that's what I would like to say. Um, I'm sorry I dropped off the screen, but my computer just, the whole thing went zzzz, and then everything went black. Um, so I'm glad I managed to get back on, but it took me a few moments to figure out what was going on. Yes, I think actually on the un uncultivated plants, so one of the interesting things that I've read recently is a book by Suzanne Simard, who was doing her research in the early 1990s. Um, and she, she was a forester and she was studying the ways in which mycorrhizal pathways were created by the roots of trees and the mycelium of, of fungi. And she only published her, book, her work in a book form just this year, and it's called Finding the Mother Tree, Uncovering the Wisdom and Intelligence of the Forest. And what amazed me when I read that was uh, the way in which 
it, it, it connects up with what Vandana has been doing, with what Farida has been doing. And it also it connected really strongly with the research I did on, on forests um, for my PhD. Uh, and actually one of the most fantastic things I, I think was that she discovered that the biggest and the oldest trees were connected to almost all the youngest, the younger ones in, in the neighborhood. So the whole forest was connected up by the rhizopogon and that's a fungi that, that connects all the trees. And I was really interested because Suzanne Simard and Farida draw the same conclusion. Um, and Farida uh, wrote about the importance of the uncultivated plant. So going back to that, and the sovereignty of food. And she wrote, land that is used to grow occupying rice, in inverted commas, cannot be used for growing the many varieties of native rice, which is what you were referring to before about the decrease, the huge decrease in the numbers of, of um, native rice. Um, and another thing was that, um, that the uncultivated plants are in communication with other plants around them. And Suzanne Simard also found out that on farms where the, vegeta the vegetation becomes really quiet. So instead of the communication of the fungi, it just goes quiet because of selective breeding. So the cultivated plants have for the most part lost their ability to communicate above and below ground. So um, the, the, the interesting thing is, I mean, this all goes to discussion about forests. And I, I grew up on a farm in the Western slopes of New South Wales. And my mother was a great tree planter. She, she was a fan of trees. She made sure that there were trees in the paddocks um, to provide shade for sheep during hot summers. And she planted trees and watered them endlessly. But until I read Farida's books, book, Women and Trees, which is this book here, um, I hadn't really understood the politics of trees. So I read Farida's book, I think back in 93 or 94. Um, and, and that was after going to the, the conference that Farida had organised. And it really, really changed me, that conference. It was one of those moments where suddenly your life takes another path. And the destruction of forests in many places has accompanied colonisation, war, industrialisation, globalisation, export. And, you know, these are the things that, that Vandana raises in her work, because she, she conceives of biodiversity as a central pr um, principle for evaluating whether a particular course of action should be embarked upon or whether a particular technology is useful. And the thing is that what has happened in recent times is biodiversity and more particularly diversity has been appropriated, has been appropriated by the corporates, it's been appropriated by the trans, it's been appropriated by all sorts of profit and, and warmongering types who just use diversity You say, oh, let's get more diversity in corporations. And what they mean is one person who can't see or who um, has uh, and, and some sort of disability or he is a black woman or is a trans, back, even better, is trans. Um, and so, you know, one person is meant to en encompass all of these things. And, I mean, it's just ridiculous. Um, so I think that the, the whole way in which diversity has been appropriated is very problematic. And I'm sure that, that these days, Vandana would be criticised for using a word like diversity. I've become far more careful about it now. But nevertheless, um, I, I still think there is something to, important about diversity and particularly about biodiversity. 
um, you know, the appropriation of diversity is, is just what corporates do. They appropriate ideas, they incorporate them, and then they try to make money out of them, which is what's happening. Now, another interesting thing about Vandana is that her father was a forest conservator and her mother was a farmer. And I think that this background of hers also shows in her, her work on, on, on forests and particularly as um, Farida mentioned before about the Chipko women who collectively fought against the destruction of the Himalayan forests. Um, and I, I think that that's uh, been a, a really important um, uh, point about, about forestry. But one of the other forestry things that I think is interesting is that the, the West started to uh, militarize forestry in the 19th century. And there's a quote from a man called Julius von Brinken, who was a forester um, who visited the very ancient Lithuanian forest of Bilovica, I'm not sure I got the pronunciation right, in 1820. And he said that what was needed were tidy battalions ready for their marching orders. So tidy battalions ready for their marching orders. And you can see that in commercial forests. What they do is they homogenize or they actually even better still, they bring in an exotic species which kills off all the native vegetation underneath the trees. And then they line them up in, in battalions uh, and then they chop them all down, clear fell. Uh, and it, it's a particular patriarchal um, uh, strategy that is used not, not only against trees, but has also been used against women. And in Australia at the moment, in, in Victoria, there is a fight over the grandmother trees, which are respected by the Jaburong peoples. And they believe that the roots of grandmother trees, birthing trees, grandfather trees and direction trees are linked and they've been trying to prevent the killing of these very particular trees so that they can widen the highway. Can you think of a worse reason to kill off really ancient trees? Uh, and it's one thing that, you know, activists have been fighting for, for uh, the preservation of trees uh, for a very long time. And, and Vandana points out in uh, Monocultures of the Mind that, um, that when the West colonised Asia, it colonised her forests and the forests were no longer viewed as having a value in themselves. And, you know, the Chipko women um, had responded by singing a song uh, when they, the foresters threatened the, their forests. They said, uh, and the, 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 the foresters said the women knew nothing. Of course, women know nothing. And they responded, what do the forest bear? Soil, water and pure air. Soil, water and pure air sustain the earth and all she bears. And that's from staying alive. So um, really just to almost finish up for me, um, this view of forest is really sorely needed in this age of climate change and in a country like Australia it's particularly so. In the summer of 2019-2020, 18.6 million hectares of forests burned and I go into detail in that in, in my book Vortex, The Crisis of Patriarchy. So respect for the old, connection, local knowledge, are all really key to living in and keeping with the limits and possibilities of nature. The global winners takes all attitude is destroying the earth. It's creating wildfires, flood storms and more. So, you know, what point is profit on a, a dead planet? And I think that Vandana has contributed enormously to a radical feminist analysis of all of those things. Um, Farida? Yeah, um, I think, uh, but um, again, you know, I go back to the issue of the knowledge, you know, the way 
women's knowledge or you know the, the way um, um, science poses you know everything that it, it gives is the right um, the i mean the reduction is science you know the way it brings uh, the issues um, at the core and that other things are not science you know or not knowledge so that is um, something that she confronted very well in the book and just i want to raise here one is um, thing from bangladesh um, this is the song uh, you know that our common people sing and it is the lalon tradition uh, susan maybe you have been to kustia and it says shukho ganjar ukko mukho and talking in english now in bangla uh, so shukho ganjar ukko mukho shadu keri upolokho aporup tari brikho dekhle jiber gyan thake na so what lalon is trying to say that you have the micro level knowledge is the is what a spiritual person would look at and you are part of it you are not outside it so when you really realize the little knowledge that is inside and the wisdom and that is the wisdom then that uh, shadu or you know the uh, saint faints because he has seen uh, or it has seen the actual truth or the wisdom there so our farmers our women you know when we work with the nature it is is the, is the entire nature they look at it they do not fragment it so i think the fragmentation is is the main problem that and that is what they call it stupidity it is not wisdom it's a, it's just a stupidity and so i would um, i think we will do in this service to monoculture of uh, uh, monocultures of the mind by not talking about biotechnology uh, issue that vandana has raised very much in that book and also the issue of the patents uh, that she talked about why we are uh, against um, biotechnology and the companies are coming up and the way she has given a lot of information um, when she wrote uh, many policy briefs for the third world network and uh, there are a lot of information where how the companies are making um, colonizing the um, uh, nature you know taking away our resources and then Uh, making uh, using the technology and patenting it in their name and so the patents on uh, on life forms is very important feminist issue we cannot as a is a violence you know if you patent a uh, human being a patent a tree a, a, a seed these are actually a violence on nature on human beings so i think the women's um, human uh, rights uh, campaign i think this is uh, from human rights uh, perspective also from radical feminist perspective also we have to see that uh, we have to fight against the patent you know because it will come to us uh, and i think it is coming on human beings uh, also so um, i think we have to resist it that's what finrich um wanted to do in the beginning and still is against uh, patenting so vandana as work is very important uh, from that point of view as well and i think um, uh, we have to as radical feminist we have to be not only critical about uh, you know patriarchy just in a in an abstract way we have to really look at the environmental policies of our respective countries about is now the climate change has come they talk about nature based solution which are just false solution they are hijacking our language and using it for their profit i think this must be challenged and we have to uh, do that so i i think the time is almost going to be over uh, susan uh, so um, uh, i i would say again that um, we have to be active uh, as uh, radical feminists whatever wherever we are we are in the village we are with the farmers we are uh, in sydney or in bangladesh or dhaka wherever we are we have to fight together and we have to be we have to join together we have to uh, share our ideas we may not agree um, 
with each other fully, but we as feminists, we are together. Yes, and I think what you said there about biotechnology, the importance of that, and I think that bi the critiques of biotechnology and reproductive technology are part of the women's human rights campaign declaration. Um, I can't remember which number now, but but that that is a really critical part um, of our campaigns, and in terms of the um, the way in which biotechnology is being abused. Uh, being used against young lesbians uh, and the way in which the trans agenda is taking over and mm -hmm. biotechnology is also part of that um, and medical well what the medical in in, in the medical exactly. industrial pro project that um, Jennifer Bilek writes about and I think that the basis of um, a lot of certainly a lot of my understanding of these issues comes from um, the, the, the research that I did the, uh, on, on the work of Vandener and others um, while I was learning this stuff in the, in the 1990s because I had not really thought about this terribly much until I went to your conference, Farida, mm -hmm. and, and suddenly, boom, <laughs> I, had to learn, I had to learn economics, I had to learn a whole lot of other stuff that allowed me to understand uh, the systemic uh, viol violation um, that was was going on. So, does anybody have any questions? I, I have been having a, a look at the chat, but I can't actually see any particular questions there. But I, I really thank those who are writing in the chat and which is quite mm. interesting that they have similar. It looks like that they also have similar understanding, which is very important, and uh, I, I can see a lot of that and which is quite encouraging and thank you for that yes thank you for the various uh comments and things that are that i've only half read some of them <laughs> yeah, it's hard to keep up. it's hard to talk and and read at the same time um what so. just question uh, is that can you connect this to traditional ways of healing uh, which is by bodil want and I think uh, there are a lot of this is a, this can be another session in itself, but medicinal plants are part of the uncultivated plants that we are talking about and women have the specific knowledge, you know, they use it for reproductive health, they use it for many other health issues and still in Bangladesh and I think in India as well, uh, such um, uh, um, um, you know, plants are used, but the companies, the drug companies are taking these as raw material for their drugs and patenting mm. them. So that mm. has, we have to be careful about. And, and Vandana was part of a, a, a legal case uh, against an American company, W.R. Grace, in 2000, I think it was, for the neem tree, uh, which has a very particular role uh, mm. in all across the subcontinent. And, and into the Middle East and so forth. A really important tree that was a spermicide, a pesticide, you, you clean your teeth with the, the, the twigs. Um, and they had basically ripped off uh, the knowledge and patented it when this knowledge mm. was already there. The, the advantage that that particular court case has was that the um, the knowledge was already written in Sanskrit, you know, which is a an ancient language, um, and so that helped to win the, that particular case. The trouble that a lot of indigenous peoples have in protecting their knowledge and their patents is that that they are uh, they don't. It's not written down. It's in their oral tradition, and because the Western system does not respect the oral tradition, which can be seen in the Jaburung fight for the grandmother trees, uh, you know, that it's like it doesn't exist. So it's invisibilized, it's erased. So it's all of those things that I was talking about at the beginning that Vandana highlighted. Uh, so I think that, that, that the issue of patents, of biotechnology is absolutely critical, uh, critical to have an understanding of that as a radical feminist. Just uh, I want to give a small anecdote on this uh, uh, medicinal plants. 
the traditional birth attendants called dyes in Bangladesh who use the plants as medicine. They uh, talk about everything about the medicine, but keep a little bit of secret for themselves. They say that, you know, we know that these uh, knowledge are being uh, pirated. So we will only teach our uh, close persons who will continue this as a profession. Otherwise, we will not sell our knowledge. They never do that. <clears throat> so this is important that they realize that they do not want to sell their knowledge. They want to share their knowledge and experience with the one who will carry it on. Um, well, thank you. I think we've probably come to the end. Oh, hang on. There's a QA and a question I've just seen at the bottom here. How can we take this forward? Links to resources. <laughs> well, we're going, to, we're going to have to send these through somehow. I, I'm, I can't do it here and now because I don't remember the resources, but perhaps we can put some information out somewhere, somehow. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah so. we will send it to WHRC email. And uh, so you can use it. Oh, there are four new yeah. messages. <laughs> Hard to keep up. Um, oh, there's the WHRC newsletter. Thank you. Yes. Okay. And okay. Yes, I think that's covered in 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 that in that chat. Um, is there another question? No. Okay. okay. We can finish it now. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you to Women's Human Rights Campaign. Thank you to, to Joe and Marianne who've been in the background and I think there is one other person as well. Thank you to Farida um, for being part of this conversation and to Vandana for yes. her work <laughs> and to the various other uh, women whose work we mentioned uh, in, our, in our talk because uh, there are many women working in, in these fields and, um, yeah, it's very important that we keep following it. Thank you very much to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Marian. And everybody who participated today. Thank you very much. Yes. Thank you.